none of us have this figured out. If we did, we wouldn't have 153 million children living. We all need to keep each other in check and have accountability and just, yeah, recognition and truth telling like to each other. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here today with my friend, Maggie Doyne. Maggie, thank you for joining me for this conversation. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. I mean, we met years ago on in different phases of um, our lives, and it, it's been such a privilege to get to witness and be a part of your journey. And I'm sure a lot of people coming to this um, episode today know a lot about you, but from your sort of mouth, tell us a little bit about your background and history and what brings you to this conversation today. I am the co-founder of the Blink Now Foundation. Our work is focused on community development, orphan care, education in the Karnali region of Midwestern Nepal. And when I was 19 years old, I was kind of accidentally traveling in Northeastern India, and I stumbled upon um, a community in Midwestern Nepal, actually with my Nepali friend, Sunita. And uh, there was a dry riverbed with children breaking rocks to earn a living. And instead of going back to college, long story short, I stayed and worked with my co-founder Tope to create Copula Valley, which is a beautiful community development project working with vulnerable children in their communities to thrive and grow and become change makers. And yeah, following the civil war in Nepal. And that's like a blip of the story, right? <laughs> and now, and now, so you're co-founder of this amazing organization. You just came out with your first book. Tell us a little bit about that and what that journey was like, how it relates to the work of Blink Now and yeah, what it means to you. So the book is called Between the Mountain and the Sky, and it's about the journey of living in Nepal, raising children in Nepal being an outsider in a community and a culture that's not your own and navigating the push and the pull of things like culture and how to bring about change in an ethical community-based way um, in partnership with the local community. It's about, it's a memoir and a coming of age and a love story and a story about motherhood. It's a story about grief and it's a synopsis of the last 15 years of my own life and my own journey and my learnings, my failures, my mistakes, my, um, yeah, just, I felt, I felt like it was time to speak more deeply about some of, some of these issues. And I think at the end of the day, I wanted something to pass on to our children. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I've loved seeing the reviews from the kids and their sort of takeaways from reading the book. I just think that's so, so special. You said the word failures and I'm curious, you know, you also have been recognized as CNN hero of the year. Like you have a large following of folks who really idolize your journey and, and the work that you've done. And you've also shared with me before that there have been videos that have gone viral for sort of good things. And there are videos that have gone viral in negative ways. And I know that this book was part of sort of your journey of sort of processing, like, what are the different pieces that have created this story over the last few, 15 years, the ones that have felt good and have felt in alignment and where are the areas that, oh, I wish I had known what I know now around X or done something differently. So will you talk to us a little bit about that and how it felt putting it on paper? For years and maybe over a decade, there were these little blips in the media that were a piece of the story. And we definitely rode the wave and uh, reaped all the benefits from media. And um, it started with Cosmo Girl Magazine. We were the face of the Cosmo Girl of the Year. And then we moved into Glamour Woman of the Year. We were on the back of the Doritos bag. 
CNN hero. At one point I was on the cover of the New York Times Magazine and we definitely leveraged that media coverage in a way that we could go out, get resources, transform that into impact and change lives. And, but with that came this surface level of the story that would just scratch the surface. Like it was a makeover story and it came with $20,000 and a Maybelline makeover. So Tope and I would be like, take the makeover, take the 20,000. We need a well, we need electricity. We need, you know, food and, and resources. And, um, I guess like in working in partnership with the local community, I realized early on, they have all the answers to their problem. They know what changes they wanna bring about following a civil war in a food deficit region with a million orphan children in the country. They, they know how to do this work. In my privilege and where I came from, I kind of saw as like, I'm gonna go and get us money. I'm gonna go get us resources. I'm gonna babysit. I'm gonna have garage sales. I'm gonna sell cupcakes. That was like the 19 year old stage. And then, then that evolved into a 501c3 and a nonprofit. But in the blips of the media, it was just this very like, you know, it would say she's working with the local community. And I always talked about co-founder and that the secret sauce and the magic and all of this is that it's it's the community formed by the community. Um, but just time after time, that was the story that was picked up no matter how we pitched it. And so our methodology was always like, okay, well, take it and go create change and go create impact. But I, I started to realize after a decade and year after year and story after story and trying to kind of step away and share that voice or share that platform that I was doing an injustice to, yeah, to how the story should be told. And, you know, I was the face of like voluntourism, of gap years, of saviorism, of all of these hot button, you know, adoption, international Mm. development, how to do this work ethically and right and in partnership. And I just felt this really immense responsibility to tell the truth beyond a CNN heroes blip, like the word hero even started to make me feel uncomfortable. Um, So I didn't, there was a time when I like, didn't know how to move away from that. Mm. You know what I mean? Because that was like how we that was our life force. And that was just like something that the media did. And we would try other ways and other things. You know, I read every book there was to read. I knew why development had failed due to colonialism, due to, um, you know, the white man's burden. I'd, I'd read all of those books. I knew that we couldn't export American culture and bring, I'm from New Jersey, bring New Jersey to this community. I, I knew that. And that was also a reason why the project was successful because we went in with that knowledge and the work worked. Uh, but I just felt like the book would give an opportunity to go deeper, mm. and bring more characters to life of who was, who were the people beyond the surface, beyond the media, beyond that heroic savior language, I guess. And, and I tried my very best to do the best I could. <laughs> yeah, I, I, t- I texted you. I, I haven't, I decided not to read the whole book before this conversation. Cause I always ask better questions when I don't know more of the answers. Um, but I, but at the very beginning of the book, you bring this up. Like it's one of the first sentences, first pages in the book. And, and I was really, really glad to see it. Cause I can imagine that you get a ton of people reaching out to you or following along sort of wanting to do exactly what you did based on that surface level media coverage. So thinking perhaps that it looks different or like decisions were made differently than they actually were on the ground. And so what would you say to someone who's like, oh, Maggie, like I want to replicate your journey and I want to do what you did right now. What would be some of your like kind of biggest takeaways or advice to someone in those shoes? Yeah, we get those messages all the time. Uh, What inspires me the most is that we usually get those questions now from people living in their own communities. So we'll get, you know, I mentor a young woman in India who wants to change her community in Rajasthan, Sri Lanka, South America, 
I'm mentoring a young gal from Liberia right now who's creating uh, Girl Up. It's an incredible organization. And so we do get those questions. And um, when I get them from people from their communities, it's awesome. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think that that's how things should be done. And it should be someone from the community. And that's what Tope was for us. He was from that community, the women who we work with, who I'm so honored to serve alongside. They're from there. And when people ask, well, why was this successful? Why did it work? Why have you been doing this work for 15 going on 16 years? I say it's because it's theirs, you know, like mm -hmm. they knew how to address these really complex problems. When it's an outsider who, like me, had that moment on a riverbed, or like me, had their heart pulled in a certain direction, or saw a problem that they wanted to see changed saw an opportunity to bring their privilege and their power and make a difference somewhere um, where their heart led them. I think the first thing I say is what's happening in the community already and find your partners, find your people, find the folks on the ground because the world doesn't need like us all to go out there to to try to change you know it needs a community in a community lifting itself up looking at how children can thrive and grow in their own communities and their own culture so that's the first question I say is like what's happening there already mm -hmm. um you know because you really have to have a deep understanding of the language the culture the people and you just won't succeed if you're an outsider dropping in being like here's how we're gonna do things. It's just, mm -hmm. it's gonna fail from the second you take one step. Um, so I, I, I ask questions. I always make sure the person's leading with curiosity, with asking, with getting to know, with trying to understand, with actually living and committing to live in community and in partnership with people. I look at intentions, but again, good intentions are not enough. It's just not enough. It's not gonna get you far enough. And I look at the team surrounding them and ask them about the team surrounding them and ask them what the people there see as the needs in their own community. And sometimes the answer is resources. And if you can are someone that can go out and get resources, great. Um, what does that look like? A lot of it's, you know, operations. How do, how do we operate? And I'm always there to mentor and look at structure and how I can help create organizational structure and how entities may work together. But yeah, and I also just share the truth about my own experience and what I learned and where I failed and at, at what points at certain stages we made certain decisions and, and what led to, to those decisions. So there's a lot, you know, there's not a lot of truth telling and collaboration and like <laughs> in this field, we don't talk about mistakes. We don't always talk about, like, it's not an industry that exactly leads itself to be like working together. Everybody often gets mm. in their own sort of vortex. And so I've really been working hard to break that vortex and find people and have these honest and open conversations and share ideas and share what's worked and build a community of change makers to be honest and open about and create these conversations. You're one of those people for me that I've mm. found that's like, okay, let's have these honest conversations and these hard conversations. Mm. <laughs> oh my God. I, um, I'm covered in chills, which is always a good sign on these podcasts that, you know, that I, or that the guest just said something really true. Um, I think what you brought up there at the end is just this very real and very destructive component of the nonprofit sector. And I think it happens for a lot of reasons. I mean, I think it happens because of money scarcity and this feeling of competitiveness. I think it, it has to do with just like the head down hustle grind nature inside the sector that partnership takes time and that off, often nonprofits don't feel like they have that time, or maybe they'd be jeopardizing their resources by doing something like that. And I also, but I, but it strikes me as this really fundamental issue to address because if we're actually going to solve like big global problems, how on earth could we expect that that's going to happen without transparency around the mistakes that we're making. Yeah. Yeah. 
look at CNN Heroes, which I'm so grateful for. I mean, it was an incredible platform. They paired the award ceremony with training with An at Annenberg Foundation, mm. both the you know, leading research on nonprofit development and the ethics around these issues. And I was so grateful to be a recipient of that, but we were voting against each other. Mm. Like it was a popularity contest of who gets the most votes. And like children's rights in Nepal is competing against homelessness in America is competing against child trafficking mm. in India is competing against health mm. initiatives around COVID. And it's like, it's a little bit, it creates that mm -hmm. sense. Of, and I remember being there in those environments, it was always voting like, mm -hmm. oh, get this many likes on social media, play that game. And I wrote about that really openly and honestly, and how like we we have to stand up against this. Like, mm -hmm. why can't the sloths' rights of South America? Like, <laughs> why do we have to vote against them? Like, I want the sloths to thrive. All of us need to be in this together because all of us holding hands and putting our hearts into making this world better is what will change. And. Mm -hmm. The second you start voting in popularity contests and social media likes is the second we're destined for failure. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I do think there's more honesty, there's more conversation around this. We've come light years in the past like few years, and that gives me a lot of hope. And yeah, and when you know better, you do better. That's what that's what Maya Angelou says. And yeah, it, it, we're all getting there. We're gonna get there. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I really appreciate you saying that because I also think I've like dreamed for a while of like a database of like nonprofit failures of like where we could go and learn, like, why didn't this thing work or, and I think it's complicated, right? Like sometimes it's hard to compare like apples to oranges because sometimes it's a funding challenge. Sometimes it's a leadership challenge. Sometimes it's a structural challenge, like an infrastructure challenge of the organization. But I think what you're bringing up is like, okay, if we don't actually sort of connect the dots around these things, break down some of these silos, there's actually a few things that are going to happen. One, we're really not going to be able to ultimately eradicate these issues. We're also going to continue, in my opinion, to set up the funding for each other in really negative ways because it's a short-term like mindset. And that carries over then to the ways that we fundraise, which is often why we see like, horrible donor retention rates and donor retention rates, in my opinion, have an impact, not just on your organization, but on the entire like infrastructure of the, not of the sector, right? Cause it's like, if a donor has a bad experience at one nonprofit, it impacts what they believe and think about the sector and how they're going to give to something else. And I think we like really undervalue the importance mm -hmm. of that. What do you think about that? Yeah like it's a huge industry as you know and it's like anything in life like one bad story and mm. then it's really easy to become tainted mm. I was just talking to a friend about this like I also think nonprofit leaders are put up on this really high pedestal of like you're perfect you have things figured mm. out you look at you off changing the world and it's this romanticized kind mm. of image of and so we hold we hold nonprofit leaders up here and then all of a sudden when there's less than you know mm. at the end of the day everybody's a human being so one person kind of falls or make a mistake makes a mistake and everyone's like oh look over there look over mm. there at that I mean th there's this there's this part I think in our humanness that likes to see the falling or the knocking down or the mistakes. And um, I don't know what that's about, but I talk to friends about it and it's like, oh, it's, there it goes again, the story of mm. perfection or imperfection or somebody mm. falling or us, I don't know. And it does hurt the industry. You know, one bad story hurts everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard like, oh, well, Sally Sue over there, like they got all of their money just taken away because blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, 
yeah, I've gone into a deep hole recently around like the comment section on Instagram for folks responding to the Ukraine crisis by giving through Airbnb or like buying digital art on Etsy, because I've been fascinated with the reasons that people are choosing to support in those ways versus giving to on the ground grassroots nonprofits. And I think it reveals a lot of the like misconceptions that, or, or one-time negative experiences that someone had with a nonprofit that then carry over to the way they think about even like engaging in social impact and with the sector. And so I think we have a lot of work to do and I wish everyone would sort of see the value in supporting like other initiatives in the sector that you're not going to get some, you're not going to be able to put on your impact report, but like your knowledge and wisdom is going to make a big difference in what happens with that organization and that impact. Yeah, I love challenging when people make those huge blanket statements of like, well, when you give, it doesn't actually go to the local people. <laughs> Big aid is bad. Diplomacy, like, you know, and then you're like, well, let's talk about that. Like, mm -hmm. what do you think is, I, I really love going there because we like to make snap judgments and talk about things we don't know about. Mm. And then when you kind of dig deeper, it's like, okay, where where is this coming from? Mm. You know how important diplomacy is peacemaking mm -hmm. you know like actually how how does how are development dollars spent from our foreign aid budget do you know what the difference is between an ngo and a 501c3 and you know how important these structures are in in countries so yeah i'm always quick to jump to well they have high overhead so <laughs> you know I'm not to them. you know it's it's there's this narrative that i think enough of us have to work really actively and conscientiously mm -hmm. and mindfully to engage in conversation and knowledge knowledge and, and more truth telling for sure mm -hmm. yeah i love that um i'm curious like i'm thinking about I mean, this book is this coming of age story, but I think about the organization really like came of age with you. And you, we've said the word perfectionism a few times. And I think about, sometimes when I think about your journey, I think about God, if an organization followed the arc of my development as a woman from 19 into my mid thirties and all the things I've grappled with around my own identity and my own enoughness and my own perfectionism and all these different pieces. How have you watched yourself and your leadership like evolve as you've evolved as a person? Like what are some of the biggest things you've sort of noticed? Mm. Luckily, Topes in his fifties. <laughs> <laughs> He's the character in the book that's always like a little bit ahead. Um, my co-founder. He's um a lot older. The thing about being young, I will tell you this. The thing about being young was that it came with this beautiful gift of not fearing failure, not having all of the what ifs, not the having the it came with this lens on the world of like, why can't we do better? Why are we still in this place as a human family? Why can't we do better for our children? I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna do better. And it was this youth and this passion and this power and this, I wanna make more opportunity for other people. And I wouldn't change that because that is beautiful. And that if we could harness that energy from every young person everywhere of using our gifts and our talents and our privilege to create a more equal and just world. That's just amazing. And that being said, <laughs> like, you know, it, it isn't enough. You need so many other things. And I think the flip side of my youth was that because I was so young, I also knew I didn't know all the answer and that it came with the curiosity and an asking of questions and needing to find people to balance that energy, mm. right? Balance that like young, like we can do anything. Let's just do this. Let's like, you know, why are children on the riverbed breaking rocks? And so I was very lucky and very humbly guided and very forgivingly welcomed into a culture and a community that saw that passion and that fire in my eyes and that connection to an outside world who could bring resources in. Um, but also able to like temper and educate mm. and <laughs> so 
surround me and like take me in as a little sister. And I think on the US side of things too, I was really guided by books. I was guided by other nonprofit leaders who had done this work mm -hmm. um, and were willing to mentor me. And I was guided by a board of directors who were lawyers and financial experts and people like women I could learn from. And if anything, my power and everything that I've learned and everything that's made us standing where we are today and that coming of age journey has been because of the people mm -hmm. who taught me and who were willing to share their truths and were willing to share their mistakes and were willing to share their vulnerabilities and that young person in me who was willing to listen and that young person in me that was willing to say, I don't know, I feel something here and it's in my heart and I wanna do better but I need to learn how first, right? I need, to, I need to learn how. The whole beginning arc of the book is that you feel it. It's like this, mm. oh, oh, mm. oh, like child putty is wrong, right? Like mm. I'm a girl from Jersey and you see young girls sleeping in child putty huts when they're menstruating. And it's like, it's the culture. And I'm like, no, I don't want it to be the culture. Mm. <laughs> um, but it's the culture. And then there's this really gray line of like, how much is the culture and how much should we be fighting this or trying to change mm. this? And the end of that arc as I'm fighting and failing and falling is like, oh, this is not my fight to fight. This is the community's fight. This is the community. And I'm just one teeny tiny speck. I'm one piece of the puzzle. But this has to come from the people, from the children, from the community. And and that's kind of where the end of that arc is mm. like, that back girl, like, let them do it. Let them, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> like, move, move out. <laughs> uh, mm. Yeah. That's the best way I can describe it is like, I'm going to throw my body and I'm going to throw my privilege in. I'm going to throw my whiteness in because if I'm there, then this thing, these things can't happen. Mm. But it was like, no, 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 no. It, it it's not, it's not that simple. Mm. because yeah. this, this card of privilege it does get you someplace it gets you far at the door uh, and then you kind of have to figure out how to use it right mm. and how to use it ethically and use it appropriately and that's a question I still ask myself all the time right what's what's my place here mm. <laughs> wow okay I know I, I really really appreciate that and I I'm going to ask like question that I haven't fully maybe flushed out, but I'm curious. So envisioning you sort of in this role where you're positioned oftentimes between the donors in the U S and the community in Nepal. And as you said before, you all did leverage these media opportunities to expand your network and you know, raise resources to do this good work in Nepal, I could imagine that while you might have had that open mind around sort of like listening to local leadership, that some of the trends we see with donors is power dynamics that involve them thinking they know best about what a community needs. And um, and I had another podcast episode that was about this, not in terms of an international development scenario, but just saying that oftentimes in human work, everyone kind of thinks they're an expert and like the line between like what's human work and what, what, you know, takes an international development background, you know, especially perhaps when you're like in the local community, like, oh, well, I just want to do this thing. And I, I'm a human, so I know what this situation needs. But as you said, like you had much more of an understanding around like sort of your role in the culture and leading with curiosity. But I'm curious, like, was there ever tension there with you and donors kind of holding that line? I think we've attracted donors who understood um, that the people know <laughs> the answers to the, and and we led with that in, in mm and meet in meetings. I think that I was from Mendham, New Jersey, got me access and got me a seat at the table in ways that I, 
we couldn't have. That being said, that's problematic too, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I saw myself as kind of like a conduit, you know, but a lot of times I would say, look, these people are incredible. They're the most intelligent, you know, amazing. Um, they know the answers to these questions. They know how to make their community better. And, and this is our plan and this is our strategy and this is how we're gonna do it. Um, so I, I think I was a good messenger in that way, sitting in donor meetings, but I also think there was more trust hmm. because I was this familiar face, right? And this promise that I was also there. Hmm. And that's where I think it could be seen as problematic. Like, I think people wanna give where they can trust, where they know that their dollar matters. And I was there to make that promise of be like, I know that this matters because I've seen it and I'm working with the people on the ground. And this, these are the changes, these are the mm. stories. Look at our children up on stage, you know, reading poetry and winning debate and playing chess and mm. this works. But I think they believed me and they invested in me because I looked like them. Mm -hmm because I was from that, that community, because I promised that I would be there on the ground seeing it out. And at the end of the day, people wanna to give to something familiar. Mm -hmm. And I think therein lies a problem. Like, look, I could do that, she's doing it. And I don't know how we begin to solve that, you know, and that's, that's a problem that, mm -hmm. you know, that people trust what's familiar to them. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason why there's not enough diversity at the table. There's not enough donor dollars being invested into people from their own communities. Uh, so I think we were able to leverage it because I was like, look, I'm there, we're doing mm. this, this is Tope, this is Milan, this is Naeem, this is, these are the kids, this, these are the people. But what I think we need to get to is making sure that Nepali women have that same platform and that mm. same power and that same trust and that same ability to sit in those meetings and not needing to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we get there? How do we connect these incredible change makers on the ground to resources without needing somebody familiar mm. looking or like the girl next door. Mm. Um, I don't know. Like that's, that was the kind of like, I don't want to call it, I don't know what to call it. Am I making any kind of sense? Totally. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I think part of this is like anti-racism training, you know, that, and I think the way that and the role that nonprofits individually and collectively can play in training their donors and recognizing where there's gatekeeping and opening the gates, you know, whether it means getting, um, you know, and, and this is always something, this is something I have been kind of grappling with recently in terms of, I know we were talking about this from a different perspective before, but like what what is a nonprofit's role in the sector? Like what is there sort of this code that nonprofits should abide by in terms of the ways in which they support the sector, right? But like when I see a nonprofit put a local who, who does international development work and maybe their headquarters are in the US, but they're putting their local partner organizations directly in front of their funders and telling them about them and trying to build trust, not where they're the person doing the thing, but they're saying, we want to introduce you directly to some of our partners. And I've seen, I've had organizations do webinars like that, where they bring their donors together and like, we want you to meet these folks on the ground, trying to connect those resources to folks. I mean, I think that's one thing nonprofits can do is to really, and to recognize that, like, especially when we're talking about individual giving, it is really not an either or situation. I mean, I think for folks who are listening to this, like a lot of people don't want to do that because they're like, oh, then they're going to give to them instead of us. No, actually they're going to feel a warmer, deeper connection to you because you gave them another meaningful experience and they're likely going to give to one of the organizations they were moved by as well. Like we're only yeah. watching individual generosity 
increase. Um, and so I would really encourage organizations to find opportunities like that, particularly if they're in a situation where they feel like they have access to resources that a lot of the organizations around them don't have. Yeah, yeah. I think our donors all loved that our donors are in, and supporters are intelligent, highly educated people. They get, I think the narrative has come like they always understood, oh yeah, well, the people on the ground doing the work are Nepali and everyone knows Tope and loves Tope, mm. loves Milan and, and loves our team. Um, but in the early days, I have to ask myself, like Tope didn't speak much English, you know, like it took a, t a long time to build that team of Nepali board of directors, of locals, of chairwomen, of middle management of like mm. it took a while. So in the early days, had we sent our local team off to suburban New Jersey to go fundraising, would that trust have been there? Mm. And would that same message have gotten across? I think it took mm. us really building a communications and a marketing plan and a narrative around that. And mm. I was the first face. And then it was like, okay, it's me. I'm there. And then look at this amazing team. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's about maybe getting in the door, but then passing on the baton and mm -hmm. sharing the platform and bringing, like you said, bringing those people to the table. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about Sunita, the head of our sustainability programming. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about our head of girls and women's empowerment. Let me tell you about mm -hmm. the director of our health and wellness program. Her name's Milan. It, we need to evolve past that place in the anti-racism work where we can get those people at the table from the very beginning. Like mm. let's get them to the table, get them the opportunities from the beginning. So it doesn't take the privilege just mm -hmm. to be the first in the door and the first ones at the table because mm -hmm. the stories that need to be there are theirs. Mm -hmm. And I think you're bringing up this really interesting sort of concept that I haven't really processed a lot before, which is also the need to examine our own power and privilege, like at different phases of our own leadership and development. Like I think, and, and letting that be a consistent practice. Like I think as my leadership grew in a nonprofit, I still acted in many ways, like I was, like I had no power. And I think it caused me to like martyr myself myself in certain ways, not flex my privilege and power in more equitable ways, or like utilize it to, to transfer power when I really could have, because I had not reflected on like my positional change. And I, you know, I joke that like, I still feel like when I wear high heels, I'm in my mom's like closet, putting on her high heels. Like there's this funny thing to me about aging where it's like, sometimes I forget that I'm aging because I still like feel like it's me that like kid inside. And I, and I think sometime as a leader, I felt that too. Like I just really didn't take the moments, even though I was growing and changing and had access to all this, all of this power and privilege and resources that I didn't have before. I was not looking at that very regularly to say, okay, what does this mean for how I show up as an, a more equitable leader with what I have at my fingertips now? Yeah. And I think we all probably got caught up in the hustle. I know I did of like, just like, okay, well, I need resources to make this mm. happen. Well, boom. Okay. Just be grateful. We got this piece. Yeah. It's a little mm. problematic, but <gasps> ignore that. It's a little problematic and just blah, blah, blah. And let's get to work. Let's get to work. Let's get this done. There are mm. hungry children. There are children that need this intervention right now. And it took a while to be like, okay, wait, step back a second. This is actually, it's time to move over. It's time to step back. It's time to hand over the microphone. It's time to make sure that there's other stories being mm -hmm. told. But you, I think I got caught up in the wheels of it all because I was just like, oh, this has to happen right now. And it was working. That mm -hmm. it, So now that we've been around and at the table for a long time, I think it doesn't have to be just that one story. I was so ready to move past that story of the girl mm -hmm. backpack and her babysitting money and DIY porn. I was just ready. I was over it. Like, mm -hmm. like, this is not being honest. And 
I think the answer to like the like okay well the virals would go vi the, the videos would go viral and the news media it would, it would take on a life of its own and there had to be a time to be like no 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 stop this is actually I think there could have been times where it's like oh, wait and I, I there were those moments where I was just like wait but I'm doing this with the local people and it would get brushed off or brushed aside and I didn't do enough in that moment to be like no 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 it's really important that this photo is mm. not of me that it's of my partner that mm. conversation this podcast isn't just with me it's with my co-founder um so we just had to get better about that in our our own communications and drawing lines and boundaries around media and how we were portrayed in the media and language because language matters mm. and we learned that lesson and now we go about engaging with the media in a very different way. And sometimes we still cringe when the piece comes out. I mean, AP Press came a couple of years ago before COVID. And I was like, hey, I, I want to be out of this. This is really important to me that it's a story on the people and this team and interview Tope and interview this woman and that woman and this teacher. And at the end of the day, the piece came out and it was the one picture of me on the cover. And I was just like, oh, I failed again. I failed mm -hmm. again. It's me surrounded by, yeah, in Nepal. So I don't know, other than to say I'm learning as I go and I failed miserably multiple times, like calling out the hero language when it happened. Mm. You know, I, I tried, I said, you know, we got to use our power and our privilege to create a more equal and just world and more opportunities. I tried to use the platform that I had as best I could to get that message across. And I was not perfect and I failed and I'm sorry for the harm and the damage that I caused. And all I can do is pass on the baton to a more, to people who can learn from me and learn from our mistakes and hopefully do better. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think like what you said, just be honest. You know, it's interesting, like I, I was just telling you before we hit record, I'm reading this book by Martha Beck, The Way of Integrity. And she talks about on this one page, I definitely did not think I was going to open this up on this podcast, but she mentions the work of this woman, Alice Miller in the book, who is a psychiatrist who talks about like the cardinal rule of all cultures is don't ever mention the rules. And <laughs> I, I just like, couldn't handle it. I just sat there and I stared at this page for so long. And I was like, what are all the rules of nonprofit that we are not allowed to talk about? And obviously I talk about a lot of them related to fundraising. Cause that's been a part of my like liberation, but I think there's so many pieces. I mean, honestly, you could have ridden that weight, you could still be riding that wave, right? And not having this moment of saying like, I wanna be honest about these things. I wanna talk about these things. And I think back to that sort of like reflection piece. And I think you're also a very like intuitive person, someone who's super in touch with your emotions. And I think it requires that to be able to step back and say like, okay, like what, what isn't feeling good? What maybe not like lies are we telling, but what are ways we're not correcting the story that we need to be correcting? Where can we be more honest? How is this narrative impacting more than just like our organization and the attention around our organization? I think those are questions like for folks who are listening to this to start to think through and like, what are the rules that you feel like you're never allowed to state as the rules around like how your organization operates, how your organization runs, what you're not, what you feel like you're not allowed to say to donors. And I think if we can all be more honest about that, we're actually going to run much better organizations and likely solve the problems we haven't been solving. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just standing in integrity, you know, like just where is the integrity? That's what I always ask myself when I'm going to bed at night and, you know, the integrity of it all. And how can we, you know, make sure that we're doing the best we absolutely can every single day, trying our best, standing in integrity, standing in truth, transparency, honesty, saying the hard things, even when it's hard. Um, that's another reason why 
I feel like we're still here and we're still doing this work and, you know, thousands of lives have been impacted by our work. And I'm proud of that. I'm so proud of that. Did we always get it right? No. But did our work always stand in integrity? Yes. You know, did we serve incredible? <laughs> did we make changes? Did we change that riverbed? Did we give opportunity to those less fortunate? Um, did we tell stories ethically as best we could? Did we protect the rights of our children? Did we uplift their voices of the, and the platforms of the women in the community we serve as best we could um, with integrity? So I think, I think focusing on that and constantly asking that question. And when you do, when you feel out of alignment, being like, okay, something's wrong here, step back, learn, listen. Oh my God, there it is. The story of the backpack and the babysitting money again. Oh my God. Like I was ready to grow beyond that too, mm. but I didn't know. I, I needed help in figuring out how. Mm. I needed less than like a one page blip on CNN heroes, I guess. Mm. And I still do. I still need help. I still need teachers. I still need to follow anti-racism movement and listen to podcasts and like just learn and learn and learn and learn and learn. So, yeah. Well, I think that like constantly curious, always learning. I mean, I feel very much there too, which like is then indirect conflict with that like perfectionism piece. Um, you know, and I think as I, I love the way you talked about your youth and how that wasn't there yet, or like in the same way, perhaps because of how new everything was. And I'm curious, like about your own awareness around as now 15 years in with all of this coverage with so many eyes on you how do you manage the, the pressure of that? And what I can imagine maybe triggers more of those perfectionism pieces. The book just broke it all down. It just broke it all down and threw perfectionism out the window. Mm. And it was about telling the truth and, um, and telling the story. And that's all we have is our own stories and our own truths and our own learnings. And just trying to do the best that I can with uh, our team to tell the truth and share our story. That's always been, like I said, like what's gotten us this far is by sharing all our vulnerabilities, by sh sharing our failures. We're a small nonprofit. Um, and what I've learned is that when you do tell the truth, people come along for the ride. We don't give our people enough credit. Mm. <laughs> you know? So I think all we can do is be honest and transparent and be like, oh, I didn't get that right. I got that wrong. I'm sorry. Like, let me try again. Let me try. Let me try again. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I hope we're going through so much rapid changes and look at how the narrative and the dialogue is just changing in this time that we're in right now. Mm. Maybe it'll come to a place where you and I can step away from the industry altogether because we're just not needed. Yes. I, I have hoped that I said that to someone the other day, they were like, where are you going to be in 20 years? I was, I was like, I don't know, maybe I'll be obsolete. That'd be cool. It'd be great. <laughs> I'd love it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Can I just be in Hawaii on the beach? Yes. We would be know. relaxing. <laughs> I would ask you like, what have you seen? How have you seen us change? And mm. like, who are you learning from in this space? Like, how are you reconciling all of this as a mm. nonprofit leader yourself and having been there and evolving in your career and watching people like me um, mm. or people who look like us, I would say, yeah. how are you finding your place in all of this? Gosh, maybe I'll say something that I definitely was not planning to say, um, but, but maybe it will be helpful for people to hear because I think, you know, when you and I first got to know each other, we were growing organizations mm -hmm. around the same time. And if I'm totally honest about what I thought or what I felt over the years, there were, there was plenty of times that I felt totally jealous. 
And Mm -hmm. I think, I actually think that's like a really important thing for me to say, because I think that is actually what is rooted in a lot of the like competitiveness and not that our organizations never overlapped in that way where I felt competitive, but I think there were moments where I felt like, what does it take to sort of have your organization go viral? Or what does it take to sort of get the recognition that you're doing really good work? Or what does it take? And I think so often in society, we use these like performative metrics to validate what we believe are important. And when I was in my early mid twenties, that was definitely what I looked at, you know, and what I thought was like validating around the strength of an organization or even the size of an organization, right? I was like, oh, well, those things must mean this in terms of a budget, or I bet fundraising is so easy for them or, right? All these stories we have and all these predictions that we make about people around us. And I know that's not the main question that you were asking, but I think it's a really, it's not something I've thought about in years. And I think it's a really important thing to sort of recognize for folks who maybe get pings of that now in their own life or with their own organization, or they're looking at other organizations feeling like they have it all figured out and how do I just blank? And oftentimes those questions have nothing to do with the work, you know, and they really have nothing to do with what really matters and I think for organizations to be better at tracking metrics, not in a performative way, but in a way that's really impact driven, both internally, like, sure, there's the metrics you're going to put on your impact report. But like I say, with fundraising, I'm like, don't just track the numbers of dollars or the number of new donors or your retention number. What are all the behaviors that your fundraisers are doing that you want to Mm -hmm. celebrate? Like, what are they doing every day? Because don't tell me what you care about. Show me what you track. You know, don't tell me you care about your fundraisers and only track money. Like, what are the things that they're doing? How are they being celebrated in other ways? Like, show me that you care about it by tracking against it, by valuing it that way. And I think if I were to do something differently earlier in my career, it would have been that really figuring out like, like, what am I actually trying to do? What am, what's the impact I'm actually trying to make? What are the ways for me to know that I'm on that journey in alignment, in integrity, And to sort of shut out, not to not learn from other people, but to shut out maybe some of that comparison noise. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think that's why it's important to have friends because Mm. you're holding everyone else up on this pedestal of like, oh, they have it figured out. Mm. People tell us all the time, oh, we look at how you do your social media. We look at your website and we're looking at everyone else being like, okay, Mm. I think we just all want to get better. And the answer in getting better at what we do and learning is each other. And then, mm. you know, when I talk and we're like, this is really hard and, <laughs> well, and, and we're able to share and come from a place of vulnerability, mm. being like, oh, this is my struggle. This is what I'm working on. And if we can just come to the table again, all of mm. us and let the guards down, let the nonprofit armor down and just be like, look, this is, this is what I figured out. This is the book. I, I like took notes on all your books. And, you know, this is like, we share podcasts and we share knowledge mm-hmm. and we share wisdom and we share our learning and our little hacks and what we're figuring out and we're in dialogue. And I think we just need more friends, mm-hmm. you know, and, and more honest conversations around, <laughs> around, around this stuff. I know that that's mm-hmm. what has gotten me has gotten me where I am so instead of just like holding the pedestal Mm. or yeah again there is a jealousy you see someone win this and like Mm. get this big grant or this big win and you're like why didn't we apply for that or like oh like they're over it's it's it is a comparative culture that we're in like Instagram Mm. world Mm -hmm. and and we as women I think we need to fight that, Mm. that comparison and just like, Hey, let's learn from each other and applaud each other and uplift each other. You've been that for me. Like you've been such a cheerleader Mm. Uh, and it's been so brave to see 
you and the other women around you hosting these conversations and having ta- saying the hard thing, right? Mm. So I think just like more of more of this in our world, and let's create community around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just, the pedestals need to go. Yeah, like, none of us have this figured out. If we did, we wouldn't have 153 million children living in poverty. Mm-hmm. 300 million children out of. I mean, if we had it all figured out. Trust yeah. me, we'd be in a way different place. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're failing forward at the very least. And yeah. Falling upwards at the very least. And that's all we can hope for. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to your point about like sharing and building community around vulnerability, around saying the hard thing, around being honest about, you know, what didn't, what didn't work or what was had good intentions, but actually had a negative impact. And, and I think I'm curious what you think about this, but for me, I think part of what, there are many things that sort of led to my sort of evolution to be able to, to talk about some of those pieces, but I definitely feel like motherhood for me has also kind of cracked me wide open in like we'll bring the, out all the bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All I'm just like, oh, I have no more time for a curated fate. I just like have no more time for anything that is not real. Um, and it's also, I think allowed me to really bond with other moms like you and to, because there's like, like rawness there or this like tenderness that maybe because the perfect mom narrative felt so impossibly far away from me. I was like, I'm never, people, my friends would send me their like DIY, like kid play tables with all the different like feeling objects in the plastic bags. And I was like, I'm never, I like, I'm never going to be that mom. Like, I'm just never, ever going to be that mom. And so for me, it was like the final like gauntlet to put down of like, okay, I'm never going to be her. I'm never going to be perfect. And maybe I was still like holding on to a little bit of that. And then for me, motherhood was like, all right, here we are. I have breast milk all over my shirt and I'm talking in front of 200 people. And just here we are. Yeah. Yeah. I also think it's really important when we're looking at who we surround ourselves with to surround ourselves with people who are critical and will tell you the hard truths. Because I think when you're a nonprofit leader, it's easy to fall into the trap of like, yes, people. And Mm. yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And I look at another reason why we've been, we've had strength and we've had endurance and we've been doing good work these years. And I think it's because I'm surrounded by a whole lot of no people and a whole lot of like, no, 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 no. Like turn it back, (laughs) dial it down. Um, and a lot of teachers and a lot of, a lot of people to hold up the hard mirrors when you need them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think we all need to keep each other in check and have accountability and just, yeah, recognition and truth telling like to Mm -hmm. each other too. Mm -hmm. Cause if we get on and we're like, I've got it all figured out. And this is, Mm -hmm. you're right about like motherhood being the ultimate, like you, we, none of us have it all figured out. So it's <laughs> it like comes all <laughs> maybe that's how I learned to be vulnerable at a really young age was just because mm. I had a very <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah I think surrounding ourselves with like those hard conversations and just having them and being like you know what I might not say this right that was the letter at the beginning of the mm. book it's like mm. I'm not gonna get this right I guarantee mm. you. <laughs> This is a very mm. complex field. I am not an expert. I only have my experience, mm. my story and my journey. And that's all I've got. That's all yeah. I can share with you is my truth and what I saw and what I learned. And that's all yeah. we can do for each other. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, that sort of loops back to that question you asked me at the end around sort of like, what have I seen or what am I following in this space around this? And, you know, I think um, definitely like, surrounding myself with people who are critical of me or who are going to push me back also feels like such an important thing. Um, and I think making sure that I'm continually educating myself in a way that doesn't put 
a responsibility on particularly the black and brown women in my life to have to do the do work for me. And so like Brianna Dorellis of connecting the cause is a huge like educator teacher around sort of white supremacy and volunteerism in particular. I like, she's a friend of mine, but I buy all of her like webinars and sort of educational resources. She has a great membership program for folks who are looking around sort of decolonizing volunteerism. Kashana Palmer is someone else I follow around a lot of sort of DEI and like equity and justice-based leadership principles. Um, so I think like also figuring out Trudy LeBron, I'm looking at doing her um, equity-centered coaching program. I'm a certified executive coach, but mm-hmm. I've always really struggled with like how coaching fits within an equity and justice framework since so much of coaching principles can get rooted in like toxic positivity or like only talking about the inner blocks when like definitely there are systematic and structural barriers. Um, And so how do you address that within sort of the like inner block conversation? So I think for me, like just also being intentional about who I surround myself with, being intentional about sort of the education and resources I'm surrounding myself with and to just really find the time, which I am not, I haven't been great at, especially actually since becoming a mom, but finding the time to like drop into my own body and listen. And I just find that even when my brain can make every excuse in the world about something like my body never lies. Um, And so if I can ask myself big questions in a quiet way and let like all the cells and all the hairs on my body stand up, I'm going to like actually be able to get to the truth of sort of what I need. And, um, so those are, those are some of the, like the ways I have been trying to like continue my journey through the sector at this, at this moment too, and also feel wildly imperfect and mess up constantly and get a lot of phone calls of, you know, being called out on something or being asked to re-examine the way I've positioned something or the way I charge for my services or work with certain partners or when I do something for free. And so have just really also, it's been a huge piece where I stay curious and open to, to really hearing feedback and saying, I'm sorry, and doing better when I know better. Um, And I don't ever think that's going to stop. We're so lucky to be alive in a time where teachers are everywhere and experts Mm -hmm. and to walk the earth (laughs) with these people. And just, I think being willing to look and and find them and, and, and listen and make time to listen. And it's a gift that (laughs) they're a gift to all of us. And we need to like give those women and those platforms resources like you said, pay for their time <laughs> and buy those books and listen. Yeah. Listen and learn. Well, I, I've learned a lot from this conversation. I'm sure everyone who's listening has too. And I really am just grateful for your honesty and your vulnerability. We didn't talk about a lot of pieces of the book because I want people to go and buy it, um, to learn more about, about your journey. And there are all these other spaces in which you're talking about some of the other just hugely momentous components of the book, like, like your experience with grief and your love story and, um, and all of those things. And so folks tell everyone where they can find you, where they should grab the book um, and any sort of last takeaways you want folks to walk away with. All right. Uh, You can follow us at blinknow.org. That's our website and our work. And we're all over social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, The book is called Between the Mountain and the Sky. It's available wherever books are sold wherever you like to buy books your independent bookstore is always awesome thanks for the opportunity to talk i'm really grateful that we that we went there (laughs) me too i'm really i'm really grateful for this conversation and i also really want to encourage everyone if you are learning more about blink now want to support their work they have an amazing monthly um donor program so you should definitely go check that out become a monthly donor um and yeah i would just really encourage anyone 
to, to pick up this book. I've been gifting it like crazy to new moms too. You, you have, I, I want to read my, you, my favorite. Well, I haven't read the whole book admittedly because I didn't want to sort of spoil alert my whole self, time, um, time. <laughs> but, um, there is this quote that I want maybe I'm not going to find it that quickly, but there's this quote somewhere near the beginning of the book where you talk about, and probably this is, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it, sort of the, the underlying piece of the, of the title, which is you talk about like, you're standing there and you're looking at the beauty of the Himalayas and you're looking at like the beauty of all your surroundings, but the most beautiful thing you see is the mother with the baby on her back. And I just like, couldn't, I just sobbing, (laughs) I just started sobbing. And, um, this thread of motherhood that surrounds your journey and this book and your work, um, is just so beautiful. So thank you for everything that you do and everything that you are. Thank you. Thank you. Here's to the journey, learning together. Thank you for the community you've created and the support you've been to me as a mother and an author. Thank you for your truth coming.